So hello, everyone. Thanks again for joining us today for our last talk in our lecture series for the semester presented by the Applied Ethics Center at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies. I am Alex Stubbs, a postdoctoral fellow in the philosophy department at UMass Boston and the IEET. And we're happy today to be joined by my colleague, Joe Vukov. Um, Joe is an associate professor of philosophy at Loyola University, Chicago, where he is also an affiliate faculty member in psychology and Catholic studies. He is the author of Navigating Faith and Science and the forthcoming book, The Perils of Perfection on the Limits and Possibilities of Human Enhancement, which is the topic for today's talk uh, entitled Humanizing Enhancement. So, Joe, we're really happy to have you here, and uh, I'll pass the spotlight over to you. All right. Thanks for the warm welcome, Alec, and thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. Is that coming through well for everybody? All right. So I want to start my talk out today in maybe an unusual way. I want to reflect on my day as I've had it so far. Woke up today about five in the morning. Um, I do an early morning so I can beat the Chicago rush hour. Brewed myself a cup of coffee, got dressed really quickly, got out the door by 5.30, asked Siri how best to get to work. And this morning, she didn't do that well. I ended up getting stuck in traffic for quite a while, but eventually got here, sat down at my desk, um, polished up this talk, went off to a meeting where I had yeah another cup of coffee, a um, couple of donuts, back here, logged on to Zoom, and here we are right now. Why do I start with a personal anecdote like that? because I think it brings out the nature of our 21st century lives. And in many ways, my life is a boring one, but I take it that in one way, our lives are really similar. In particular, we live these lives that are this mixture of brand new technologies like Zoom and Siri on our smartphones, but also these well-worn things like donuts and writing things out by hand. And we live our lives too with this mixture of things that are probably considered enhancing technologies. On the way I understand enhance enhancement, Coffee, for instance, is an enhancement on almost any way you cut up enhancing technologies, um, and also things that most definitely are not. Again, donuts is a good example. I don't think donuts enhance us in much way whatsoever. So the question then that we're left with in the 21st century is, how do we navigate our 21st century lives as new technologies keep on coming towards us, as we're presented with ever new opportunities for human enhancement, how to incorporate those opportunities into the lives that we're already living? Those are really big questions, but they're the central questions I take it in ethical and normative conversations about human enhancement, and they're ones we're going to be focusing on today. I'm going to be narrowing my talk down just a little bit, though. So rather than focusing generally on questions of enhancement, we will be focusing on that. But I also want to hone in specifically on transhumanism, um, one, one group of scholars and theorizers that have thrown in their lot largely on the side of human enhancement. And here's the thesis I'm going to be arguing for. New technologies present novel possibilities for human enhancement. It can be tempting to think they present an avenue for realizing human potential and that we should embrace them. Transhumanists endorse this idea. In advocating for their position, however, transhumanists, I'm going to argue, fall into one of two problematic positions. On the one hand, ableism, the idea that certain abilities rather than intrinsic value confer human worth. And on the other, a quiet desperation that comes from chasing one new thing after another. This does not mean we should reject new enhancing technologies um, I'm not a Luddite. I actually am in favor of certain enhancing technologies, but I do want to advocate for the position that we must be vigilant in embracing these technologies and carefully articulate our values before doing so. So that's where we're going. Here's how we're going to get there. A quick definition of what human enhancement is, or at least the one I'll be using for this talk. Second, just a quick 50,000 foot overview of various new technologies for, new for human enhancement, just to kind of give a lay of the land. Third, a brief introduction to transhumanism. The most argumentative part of the talk is then the next part where I'm going to run a dilemma, the transhumanist dilemma, we'll call it. And then finally, having run that dilemma, reflect for a little bit in closing about what I think is a more humanizing approach to human enhancement. So first of all, this question, what is human enhancement? Um, I could do a whole talk just on this. There's a really deep literature on what human enhancement is exactly and how to define it. I really do like the, the well-worn way of defining human enhancement in contrast to treatments, where treatments are understood to be interventions that attempt to restore a healthy level of functioning, and an enhancement is something aimed at going beyond health. 
Now, of course, there's a lot of definitions baked into that definition. We'd have to talk about what health is. We'd have to talk about restoration. Um, there's there's certain norms that are getting imported even to that definition. Um, but on sort of a superficial initial level, I really like these definitions. I think it has a lot of traction with at least uh, an initial definition of what human enhancement is. Um, some examples then that follow from this, my glasses, for instance, I have really bad eyesight, worn glasses since I was in third grade. To the point where if somebody asks me if I'm nearsighted or farsighted, my response is it really doesn't matter. Without the glasses, I can't see anything. So um, my glasses, though, with them, can't quite see 2020, but pretty close to it. So on that definition, my glasses are restoring healthy eye functioning. They're, they're attempting to restore what normal healthy eyes are supposed to work like. So it's going to count as a treatment, not as an enhancement. Whereas a pair of binoculars, um, which allows me to see things five or 10 times away, go on whale spotting expeditions, or more, maybe more likely when you buy the nosebleed um, seats at the, the pro baseball game, and you can't see a thing you bring your binoculars with to be able to let you see. Um, that's going to count as an enhancement insofar as it's an intervention aimed at taking your abilities beyond mere normal or healthy levels of functioning. Um, I use this example purposefully in that I think there's a really normative implication that I wanted to kind of peg right away, which is that I think initially when people come into these conversations about the norms of human enhancement, at least certain people come into them thinking there seems to be something morally problematic or morally suspicious about human enhancement, right? You hear the term and I think some people start to get, get morally apprehensive already, I wanted to bring in the example of binoculars because I think it's an example that does a good job of highlighting that there can be technologies such as binoculars, which at least on most definitions of enhancements count as enhancements. And yet I don't know of anyone who has ethical reservations about using binoculars. So all that's to say is that I think when we're doing ethics of human enhancement, it's never going to be so easy as to say this intervention is used, being used for enhancement purposes, therefore it raises moral red flags or moral questions in a way that mere treatments don't. I think it's much messier than that. In fact, I think it's messy in several other ways as well, which we can get to eventually in the Q&A if we'd like to. Um, but I think that's an important point to note before doing anything else. What I wanna do now for just five minutes or so is give you a really rapid fire overview of new technologies of human enhancement that I take it count as human enhancements on the definition I just gave you, but probably do on most other definitions as well. So first of all, cognitive enhancement. This is the area that I work in probably most extensively, so I wanted to lead with it. Um, and again, I could go in a lot more detail about all of this if we wanted to. I just kind of want to do a, a 50,000 foot view here. Um, transcranial magnetic stimulation is a technology. It's, it's really a simple technology in a lot of ways. It's a, it's a wand neural stimulator. If you look up pictures of it, I should have had a picture in the slideshow here, but it's, it's literally a wand that you can um, wave over the surface of your head. And then it provides electromagnetic stimulation, very low risk involved. It's a very simple um, intervention in many ways. Um, it's pretty neat the way that it functions. You can, you can watch people. If you look it up on YouTube, you can find people, you can shut down motor activity. You can create temporary aphasia. You can um, cease people's ability to speak if you know the right area of the, the, um, the, the brain to stimulate it in. Um, it's also been put to use recently in enhancing applications. And this was a study from 2014 that I'm referencing here. And I, I threw in um, one, one chart up on the, on the PowerPoint there in which they were using TMS to attempt to increase associative memory abilities. And you'll see there the two conditions, there was a stimulation condition and a sham condition, right? So the sham condition, people were still having the wand waved and it still made a clicking sound. And I think they even gave them a little bit of stimulation. So it felt like they were feeling something. It just wasn't enough to have an effect. Um, and you see that when compared with stimulation versus sham condition, it had a really significant, right? So the error bars, there's some distance between those there. Um, they were able to increase subjects' associative memory significantly. Um, I could talk about this more. The task here was a classic associative memory task where they were pairing random faces with random words and then tested on their recall of which faces were paired to rich words. It's a classic associative memory test. And they were able simply by you know, zapping their brains at the end of the day to get a significant increase in associative memory. Um, so there's one example of human enhancement. There's a whole bunch of other neural stimulation technologies. Um, we could talk about 
too, that are also being used to, to really impressive effect at increasing people's abilities along a wide variety of spectrums. Brain computer interfaces are another one. Um, the most notorious right now that's showing up everywhere is Elon Musk's Neuralink, right? Um, it's literally a brain chip that can pair with your iPhone. Um, they're not using it in humans yet, but have used it to great effect in chimps and pigs. And the initial application they're looking to use it for is for prosthetics. So basically where the chip in your brain would communicate with an iPhone, which in turn would communicate with a prosthetic and allow you to control the prosthetic directly through brain waves. Um, there's also a lot of applications though people are talking about, about the way once this technology is perfected and the way that we could use it for enhancing applications as well. Sort of an immediate application here would be a glorified Fitbit. In fact, that's the way Elon is advertising the Neuralink as, as a Fitbit for the brain. You can imagine not only getting data about your heart rate on your iPhone through your Apple Watch, but also all sorts of neurological data that you could use to all sorts of effect for maximizing efficiency and whatever else you might want to put that information to use with. Just one more when it comes to cognitive enhancement. Um, study drugs, so the use of Adderall, Ritalin, Modafinil, other medications like this that are used, typically used to treat ADHD can be used by subjects without ADHD diagnoses. And in fact, um, I think we're all right around finals week right now. So this is a hot topic among my students, at least. They're pretty prevalently used among college students between 7% and 30%, but that number actually ticks higher in more demanding majors and more prestigious institutions. So pre-meds at Yale have a fairly high usage of study drugs. I would guess quite a bit over 30% here. Um, do they work? Answer is yes, in some contexts. So um, there's been a good, good review work done recently that suggests that at least in, in some contexts, using things like Adderall and Ritalin for the sake of boosting associative memory and some other tasks can be fairly effective, but not all tasks and not for all subject pools. They said, we're just doing a 50,000 foot view here. So another area of human enhancement that gets talked about quite a bit, in addition to cognitive enhancement, is life extension. There are some encouraging findings. Um, a recent review of the drug metformin, which is a drug that was developed to treat type two diabetes, has been recently found to increase lifespan in C. elegans by 36%, which is pretty impressive. Um, although I will say eternal worms are kind of the stuff of nightmares. So I don't know if this is optimistic or a little bit um, dystopian to think about increasing the lifespan of C. elegans by that much. Um, does it work in humans? Answer is maybe. There's some evidence coming out that it could help with human humans. Um, the trick here is that it's mostly been studied in populations with type 2 diabetes, so it's not clear if it's going to generalize. But that's one, one um, route for life extension that people are getting excited about in the last couple of years. Um, resveratrol from red wine can also help increase life. When you see, um, you see venues like the Today Show pick this up, it'll always feature somebody drinking a glass of wine, right? This is, this is about a 10 year old study saying, hey, if you have that glass of red wine every day, it'll increase your lifespan. Well, it turns out it takes about 100 to 200 glasses of wine to actually to have the effects that have been found, um, which it turns out have some negative effects as well, having that much wine a day. Um, but if you just take the resveratrol, you can get some of those positive effects as well. There also, though, there, there's some real science of life extension. There's also a fair amount of quackery. Um, I've got two up right here. Whether, whether these are total quackery or not, we can talk about more. But it's interesting that many of the big Silicon Valley companies, you have to do a little bit of digging, but they also have a life extension um, wing of their house too. So Calico is Google's. That's All of this is very hush-hush. It's very hard to figure out exactly what they're doing, just that they're pumping a lot of money into them. Um, Calico is Google's. The California Life Company um, is very invested in life extension. They, they do publish some stuff on their mice models. It's not clear um, what else, all, all else they have been doing. Um, I also bring up this other one called Nectome, which is a little bit less known, but you will hear about it more because this is the side hustle company of OpenAI, who of course brought us ChatGPT and is now rolling in the money. Um, and they're, they're also looking specifically at how to 
create permanent memories, um, but it's basically a version of life extension technology too, which again, as open AI is reeling in the money will likely get funded more and more and you'll see more from them. Finally, and I, I've only got one slide on this, which seems unfair, but there's obviously been a lot of talk about CRISPR-Cas9 and gene editing as an avenue for human enhancement as well. Um, the person you see pictured here is Dr. Um, He Jong-Q, who notoriously performed publicly CRISPR-Cas9 on two human twins, Lulu and Nana. Um, it didn't work great. The, the CRISPR-Cas9 was used to try and confer HIV resistance on the twins. The father was HIV positive. Um, it only worked on one of the twins and the remaining twin. It was, it, it sort of gave them a little resistance, but it wasn't even perfect. Um, it probably does count as a form of human enhancement and at least that one twin, cause it was, the twin was a little bit more HIV resistant than would have been otherwise. Um, Dr. Jan Q, however, was roundly criticized by the bioethics community and actually just got out of a three-year prison sentence in China um, for having done that. But that said, while there are certain dangers around using CRISPR-Cas9 for human enhancement, basically everyone working in this agrees that it's absolutely possible and we just have to get around some, or not get around, we have to work through certain ethics and regulatory questions before we start using it in humans. So the question here isn't one of feasibility, it's really one of regulation and ethics. Um, this is absolutely an open door for us to go through when it comes to enhancing human beings genetically. So the question here, I always like throwing this line in because I grew up in the 80s and 90s and Jurassic Park was very formative um, in me becoming a philosopher and liking science. Um, the chaos theorist, Dr. Ian Malcolm in that movie, when he's confronted with the questions of recreating dinosaurs, Ask your scientists were so preoccupied with whether they could, they didn't stop to think about whether they should. Um, so of course, that's where we're going. We're going to be thinking about the ethics and the normative landscape of using these technologies to the effect of human um, enhancement. I want to focus our discussion, though, on transhumanists, um, one group that are united in their enthusiasm about human enhancement. It's an amorphous group, and I want to talk about that in just a second. So I think transhumanism is an interesting interesting collection of people in that it's not only an academic theory and a group of academic theorists, but it's also a broader cultural movement. Um, but they really are united generally in enthusiasm for human enhancement projects. I think in thinking about transhumanists, it is helpful to think about three concentric circles in which we can understand transhumanism. Um, the first are the scholars who actually advocate for think through, publish on transhumanist themes. And that's obviously a really central part of the transhumanist project. But transhumanism, like I was saying just a minute ago, is not just an academic theory. It really is a cultural movement. So you also get proponents of transhumanism who aren't necessarily academics and who are putting forth ideas, not in academic journals, but on Reddit. I'm going to show you in just a second. Reddit is really one of the places where transhumanism lives. Um, so obviously not everyone contributing there is an academic, but that's one place where transhumanist ideas are really fostered and mold over. But the last thing I want to suggest to you is that even if you're not a transhumanist, I think there's an even wider circle of cultural values and attitudes that feed into transhumanist projects. So I really do think that transhumanism taps into wider cultural values that even those of us that might not consider ourselves transhumanists really do incubate in a wide variety of ways. So I don't think transhumanist projects and values and ideas are coming from nowhere, but are rather a really, it's a, it's a part of the normative landscape that we inhabit and that really just comes to a point in um, explicit transhumanists. So Nick Bostrom, sort of the quintessential transhumanist, not the only one, obviously, but um, the one that most people think of, I think, first when you start thinking about transhumanism. This is from his essay, Transhumanist Values, 20 years old, a little bit dated when it comes to research, but it's such a classic, you have to quote from it. Here's him describing transhumanism. The vision in broad strokes is to create the opportunity to live much longer and healthier lives, to enhance our memory and other intellectual faculties, to refine our emotional experiences and increase our subjective sense of well-being, and generally to achieve a greater degree of control over our own lives. 
This affirmation of human potential is offered as an alternative to customary injunctions against playing God, messing with nature, tampering with human essence, or displaying punishable hubris. Again, I think transhumanism is a broad enough movement. It's unfair to say that Bostrom captures the vision of transhumanists generally, but he certainly captures some of the core values. Transhumanism also lives in a much wider community. You'll see here, this is a screenshot from recently, a week or two ago, I think that I took this screenshot. Currently 72.3 thousand members on the transhumanist Reddit thread. Um, it's a top 5% thread, right? So um, this is definitely something that gets traction, not just in academic circles, but in broader circles as well. Um, I also took some screen grabs of life extension Reddit um, and space exploration Reddit. Um, these are all themes that tend to attract transhumanists and tend to be places where those ideas are fostered and discussed. But as I mentioned a minute ago, I want to suggest to you that transhumanism is not just a scholarly pursuit and not just a group of people who embrace it in online communities, but it's also a set of cultural values and attitudes that many of us explicitly or implicitly incubate. So getting a new iPhone when your new iPhone or your old iPhone works perfectly well, I take it that's a version of transhumanism, embracing the new just for the sake of its newness. The use of energy drinks, again, I'm a big coffee drinker, but there's a certain sense in which using energy drinks or coffee or other kind of stimulants in order to become a higher achiever is a form of transhumanism. Again, does that make you a transhumanist? No, but it is sort of a, a version of pursuing efficiency. And dreams of space exploration is really, we didn't talk about that much. It's when it comes to human enhancement, but I don't know how many of you watched the SpaceX launch last week or two weeks ago. Um, when I was watching that, I was certainly thinking about the possibilities for space colonization and space exploration. Um, it's definitely part of the cultural landscape we live in to be excited about that sort of thing. And again, that's the sort of thing that even if you're not an explicit transhumanist is a value feeding into transhumanist projects. Um, so all of this slide is actually also a bit of a meta commentary. I created all of these images using artificial intelligence. Um, and in fact, all of the images you're seeing today, I use new artificial intelligence platforms to create the images. Um, that's the little transhumanist in me. I'm really into the AI stuff and really um, using it a lot in my, in my teaching and um, all sorts of different avenues. So um, I think that's another area in which sort of getting excited about new technologies and pursuing them for the sake of a better or more efficient life is a way of channeling transhumanism. We now get to the argumentative heart of this paper um, and where, again, it's maybe not the, the most time that I'm going to spend, but I wanna run this dilemma for you because I think transhumanists, and by here I mean both explicit defenders of transhumanism, but also all of us insofar as we incubate and act based on transhumanist values and desires and norms that we face. And it comes down to a simple question. Why pursue enhancement at all? So what's, what's good about it? Why, why pursue um, Neuralink? Why try to maximize efficiency when it comes to our study habits? Why rely on coffee and energy drinks in order to become just a little bit sharper? Why do we get excited about space exploration and living an extra 20 years? Um, well, I take it part of the answer here is that an enhanced life is a better life but I think that can be interpreted in at least two ways. So on the first hand, we could be saying in enhanced life, there's something objectively better or more valuable about the sort of life that we would achieve through human enhancement. That's option one. Option two, um, and I'm open to thinking there's a third option here too. These are the only two that I see. Option two is to say that it's not that the life that we would live is a better or more valuable life, just that it provides us with goods and maybe new or novel goods. The dilemma I want to run for you is that both options are problematic and ultimately dehumanizing. So consider option one first. Option one says that an enhanced life is objectively better or more valuable. Um, that there's, there's something about the life lived 
in an enhanced way, whether the transhumanist or post, we haven't brought in posthumanism too much today, but sort of this more efficient, longer lived, more connected life is more valuable. And I think this is ultimately a problematic line that a lot of transhumanists, scholarly transhumanists would actually agree with this, but I think it's worth making it explicit why this is problematic. They want to do that through a couple of vignettes. Um, so first of all, consider Mercedes. Mercedes is a transhumanist. He's undergone genetic enhancement, sought out all the neurological enhancement we discussed, and gotten some life extension to boot. On weekdays, you'll find her in her swanky Manhattan condo. On weekends, hobnobbing with celebrities in her sprawling house on Long Island. At 85, she looks 35. Next weekend, she'll take her monthly excursion into outer space. Overall, Mercedes is happy. Contrast Mercedes with Xavier. Xavier lives in a small rural community. He works as a carpenter and spends his weekend camping with his wife and three sons. The job takes a toll on his body. He has a bum shoulder and a bad back, but by his lights, a few aches and pains are worth it. Xavier scoffs at transhumanist projects, give him a day on the lake with his sons any time over a trip to space or zap to the brain. In most weeks, he can do just that. He's happy to. And finally, consider George, who was born with cerebral palsy and since the age of 25 has lived full-time in a wheelchair. His daily treatments can be painful and he isn't expected to live a long life but he enjoys online gaming and has built a community of friends through the internet. Overall, George is happy as well. So I think these vignettes bring out what I see to be the problem with option one. To say an enhanced life is objectively better entails not merely by my lights that there are aspects of Mercedes' life that are better than the lives of Xavier and George. Um, in a way, I take it that's obvious. I mean, who, which of us wouldn't like to live with a few less aches and pains and live a little bit longer. Those are clearly good things. But I think leaning too hard into this idea that the enhanced life is more valuable or objectively better or um, that, that sort of putting that much emphasis on it entails eventually that Mercedes' life is more valuable than that of Xavier or George. So where I think this ultimately lands you is a version of ableism. Um, I think leaning too hard into the idea that enhancement itself confers something like objective value or objectively better life um, ends up forcing us eventually into the position that value is a function of ability or substitute whatever you want in here. Value is a function of efficiency or value is a function of the length of life or the, the, is a function of um, IQ. And in that way, it belongs to a family of views that divvy up worth or value based on credentials rather than inherent worth. Um, I think once you actually articulate that vision, I think most of us would find it to be problematic. And I assume that we want to avoid it. So that's the argument against option one. Um, the more you lean into enhancement as conferring objective value or as a objectively better life, I think you start getting very close to ableism very, very quickly. So what about option two? This is simply to say that enhancement, human enhancement can confer goods, right? That there are good things that we can pursue as a result of human enhancement. My initial response here is that, well, that's obvious. There are obviously good things that human enhancement can confer. Um, longer life, is that a good? Sure. More intelligence, is that a good? Of course. Um, certain things that genetic enhancement can confer, are those good things? Yeah, I have no problem with that. The problem, though, is that recognizing that there is a good to be pursued doesn't entail the pursuit of that good over other goods, and it may not even entail the pursuit of that good at all, depending on the context you're in. Um, here's an example. Consider the good of cake. Um, I take it Cake is a good. I recognize it as a good at least. That doesn't mean that I should pursue it at the expense of other goods. I clearly don't want to eat cake every meal. Um, that would not lead to a healthy life. Nor in certain contexts would I want to pursue cake at all. Maybe I'm training for a marathon. So I think just establishing that transhumanist projects that an enhancement. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> confer certain goods is not sufficient for actually recommending them. I think further argument is needed before you get to the argument that those goods are worth pursuing. Um, and many transhumanists have seen this. 
and have gone to arguing that, and, and Bostrom is one of them, that it's not that enhancement provides an objectively more valuable life. It's rather that enhancement can provide us with goods that are genuinely new or genuinely different than ones we've had before. So here's Bostrom again. We should pursue enhancement because it provides the opportunity to explore the transhuman and posthuman realm. In this realm, there are greater values than we can currently fathom. So what's Bostrom getting at here? Here's an analogy for you. This is what AI image generators think of when prompted with bringing my dog to an art museum. Right? Suppose that you were trying to convince your dog of the good that's being presented in a work of art. It's going to be an uphill battle, right? You're not going to be able to talk about the colors or the mood that's being conveyed or art history and where this falls in the history of art and aesthetic development. Why? Because your dog simply isn't cognitively up to the task of appreciating that good thing, right? It's a good that goes beyond the cognitive resources that your dog has or ever could have. Now, I take it what Bostrom is doing here is giving an argument similar for the sorts of goods that human enhancement can present with us. Suppose you're having a conversation with a future transhumanist, someone who's pursued enhancement along every single line that you could think of. What Bostrom's suggesting is that enhancement can confer new goods that we can't conceive of now because we're too cognitively limited. Maybe we just need to have a longer life and we need to be more efficient to have a little higher IQ and a little more intelligence in order to appreciate those goods. So is it that the transhumanist or the person who pursues enhancement lives an objectively better life? No, it's just that that person, because they have increased cognitive abilities, can appreciate a wider range of goods in the same way that you and I can appreciate a wider range of goods than your dog can. Here's the problem, I think, with this position. Um, I'm going to turn here maybe to an unexpected place for the 19th century Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard. Um, and Kierkegaard asks us to think about this phenomena that he refers to as crop rotation. And what crop rotation here is an analogy, obviously, with actually rotating crops. But what he's getting at is the, the rotating in pursuit of new desires simply because they're new and different than the desires and goods that we've pursued before. Um, I take it if that the move for grounding the good of human enhancement is simply to say that we now have a wider range and more options than by, by pursuing enhancement because we've got a, a wider cognitive grasp or, or higher cognitive capacity, that there isn't anything objectively good about these new goods, that there isn't any certain things that are going to sort of confer an objective value, that you end up with just a wider range of goods that you end up rotating through rather than identifying anything actually worth pursuing. Um, so I want to illustrate this really quickly. This is um, Kierkegaard on crop rotation. He's obviously not talking about enhancement here, but I think the, uh, the, the, um, the point generalizes and applies. I can't be bothered. I can't be bothered to ride. The motion is too violent. I can't be bothered to walk. It's strenuous. I can't be bothered to lie down for either I'd have to stay lying down and that I can't be bothered with, or I'd have to get up again. I can't be bothered with that either. In short, I just can't be bothered. This is the picture of someone who's just pursuing one good thing after another without any rhyme or reason or commitment to any one of those goods. Kierkegaard thinks that that ends up in a desperate condition. We can imagine Mercedes saying the same thing. Mercedes, remember, is our character has pursued all of these enhancement projects. Um, she might think, I can't be bothered by the new IMAX Plus movie. Too noisy. Can't be bothered by another 30-course Uber dinner. Too spicy. Another trip to the moon? Not enough gravity. And don't even mention another ultra mega mondo marathon too long. Truth is, I can't be bothered by anything. Kierkegaard's word for this state is despair. And that's my worry with taking option two. Remembering that option two is this idea that enhancement doesn't give us anything objectively better, right? That would, that would lead us into ableism. And Bostrom is actually, not all transhumanists maybe take this line. Bostrom is very explicit. No, it's not objectively better. It's just new novel. It's a wider range of goods. 
Um, I don't see how that without any commitment to any of those goods or without any elevation of those goods as better in some way over the other doesn't lead us to something like despair. I don't want this argument just to apply to explicit transhumanists. I want it to apply also to transhumanist motivations. So I suggested earlier that transhumanism, the way I understand it, is not merely explicitly self-identified transhumanists, but rather a set of motivations, a set of motivations that chase the new, that pursue enhancement, that see it as a good. Um, again, anything from trying to get a little edge through your intake of caffeine or nicotine or whatever, or Adderall, or through, um, through just excitement about new technologies, I think that it applies the argument that I've run to transhumanist motivations generally. I think when we're motivated by the new, to really to sit back and ask ourselves, what is it that's motivating us? Is it the motivation that we think that efficiency and longer life and being smarter is something that confers value objectively? If so, I really worry that we're close to ableism. Is it merely that it's the next new thing or that it's an increased range of goods that we can pursue? In that case, I think those motivations are really close to despair. That's the end of my formal argument. Um, I take it though that nothing I've said today actually gives any argument against pursuing enhancement itself. What I've tried to raise for you is an argument that calls into suspicion a sort of certain set of motivations for, for pursuing human enhancement, but not an argument that undermines our pursuit of enhancing technologies themselves. Um, I actually think that enhancement can be a really good thing in certain contexts, despite the, the overall arc of the argument I just gave to you. So I want to close on this note is that I think enhancing technologies, whether they be life extension, whether it be cognitive enhancement, whether it be the other things that we talked about today, can be pursued and can be pursued for the good if we start by first scrutinizing our values. If we start by thinking about what does a worthwhile human life look like? What are the goods that make our individual lives worthwhile? What are the social goods that we are pursuing? In what ways does enhancement fit into just social systems? We start with those questions and then figure out where enhancement fits in. I take it that some of the, the glamour of certain new enhancing technologies might be deflated, but that we very well might find all sorts of ways for enhancement to fit into that picture. And I think that if we approach it that way by starting by values of shared humanity, values of common and social goods, that then we wind up with a picture of enhancement that is genuinely a human one. Thank you. Just throw this up really quick. This is coming from um, a new book that is coming out in just a couple of weeks. So um, that's where this argument was coming from. I will stop the screen share. All right. Thanks a lot, Joe. Uh, much appreciated. So we now are going to move into the Q&A section. So I'll, uh, I'll let whoever wants to take the reins go ahead. We've got a small group here, so we can just go ahead and talk. So Jay, why don't you get us started off? Provocative, um, at least for me. And um, it reminds me that uh, back when uh, Christopher Reeves broke his back, the actor who played Superman, he started a nonprofit organization to support stem cell research into spinal cord injuries. And a lot of folks in the um, paraplegia, quadriplegia community were not happy with that um, and accused him of ableism because he wanted to walk again. Now that walking again is not enhancement by your definition. Although I think your argument has a weakness, which is that apparently preferring any mental or physical condition to any other is ableist, but we can come back to that in a second. But the, I think the point about um, Christopher Reeves is that um, ableism is not, I, I didn't perceive what he was doing was ableist. It was his choice that he would prefer that condition to another. And when we get into seniors, you know, seniors have mobility limitations. If I want to walk as fast as a 20 year old, I would need enhancement, but it's within the realm of human possibility to walk as fast as a 20 year old. In fact, I used to do it. So um, 
I think that there's this huge gray area and this problem with motivation. And I'll, the final comment would be um, that I completely agree with you that hedonic utilitarianism doesn't do the work that we need to do. And that's why Nick has, Bostrom has uh, assiduously avoided it. Um, that a lot of evidence has pointed to, although there's some counter evidence as well, has pointed to the fact that people who have disabilities or health conditions are just as happy after some period of time. There's hedonic adaptation over time. So hedonic um, uh, utilitarianism will do the work of just discriminating between preferable life conditions. Um, and I don't think a completely libertarian approach is satisfactory either, either to just say everybody should do whatever they want and, and we'll leave it at that. Um, wireheading is another thing you, you transhumanists worry about, which is that we could just stick wires in our head and be as happy as we want. That would screw up utilitarianism pretty bad. And so personally, I've been more attracted to the uh, Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum approach, which is to replace for public policy purposes, the consequentialism of hedonism with a consequentialism of capabilities. And I think that this fits very well with a transhumanist agenda, which is to say, we want everyone to have as much mental and physical freedom as they possibly can, to have as many capabilities in mental and physical realms as they can. And the good society would be the one that maximizes that. Now, is that gonna be an ableist society? I think it probably would say that being able to walk faster in general is a good, right? And being able to think faster and have a better memory and have more control over your emotions, et cetera, et cetera. All those would be goods that we want to maximize in that kind of society. And I don't know if you've considered their approach, but just throw it on the table. Great, thanks for the question, Jay. So a couple of responses. First, one thing I want to do is um, emphasize that I think both, and you mentioned this in passing, but both what counts as a treatment versus enhancement, but also I take it whether the enhancement is a good worthy of being pursued is going to be context relative in a really sophisticated way. Um, so one of my favorite examples here is Aristotle always gets hung up on this figure, Milo the wrestler, right? So um, I, I had a period where I read a lot of Aristotle and he's always coming back to this, this Milo figure and talking about Milo's diet, right? And Milo's role is, I take it sort of in the, the ancient Greek context, kind of like Michael Phelps is in ours, where he's this notorious wrestler and also has this notoriously large appetite, right? Because he's got to keep up with all the wrestling. And Aristotle keeps coming back to this, this idea that what's a healthy diet for Milo would clearly not be a healthy diet for you and I. Um, and the idea here that I, I like when it comes to discussions of enhancement is it first makes the point that what counts as an enhancement to begin with, and this is the Christopher Reeves point, I, I remember that whole discussion too when that was happening, um, what counts as a treatment versus an enhancement is going to be importantly context relative to how the intervention is being applied, right? So for, for him, it might be a treatment, but for somebody else, the same sort of research might be playing into something more enhancing. But I take it the context relevance or relative relativity also is going to play into the ethics of enhancement and whether it actually is a good worthy of being pursued is going to be importantly relevant to the context we find ourselves in. So in certain contexts, really efficient thinking, a longer life are clearly going to be goods, but I don't wanna say that that's true in every and all contexts. Um, I think that, that it's gonna be much more fine grained than that. So I guess the first thing I would wanna say is that, yeah, I agree with you. And I think that taking context into consideration will help with some of those concerns. The second thing I wanted to address was your idea of preferences um, and that, yeah, it's going to be typically preferable to walk a little bit faster or think a little bit better. Um, I don't have a knockdown argument for that, but what I do wanna suggest is that I think when we actually reflect on preferences in the wide scheme of both ourselves as individuals and ourselves as social beings, I think some of the things that at first look to be obviously preferences may not actually be as preferential when we dig down a little deeper. So something that I've thought a bit about is something as simple as something like life extension, right? So again, initially, 
I have the thought that, well, of course it's right. You know, do you want to live to be 90 or a hundred? Well, obviously it's preferential as long as they're good years. Of course, 10 more years would be good. I could write another couple of books or I could, you know, engage in more hobbies or I could do all the other sort of things that a little bit of extra life could afford me with. But I think when we really start reflecting on something like life extension, and, and again, just on the level of preferences, I'm just not sure that it comes down to actually being preferential. Um, especially if we start talking about radical life extension, it's going to change the nature of how we relate with previous generations. Do I really want advice from my great, great, great grandpa um, about my life decisions? I, maybe, maybe he was a wise person, but I, it, would, it would certainly change generational dynamics. Um, do I really want to live to be all that old? I, I Maybe, maybe, but I, I think that when we start reflecting on it, um, and the actual social and individual implications of certain certain enhancing technologies, I think it's less clear that it's even preferential. Um, again, that, that's not an argument across the board. I'm sure we could think of examples that are pretty clearly preferential well, to pursue this good. Yes, yeah, most go ahead, governments Jim. around the world have public health policies with the stated goal of keeping as many of their citizens alive as long as possible and keeping them as healthy as possible. You think those should not be public policies? Um, no, I don't, I wouldn't go that far. I, I would go as far though, to say that I, I don't, I'm not convinced that living as long as possible is, is a good when we actually think about it in relation to other goods that we want to pursue. Um, this is, this is, a uh, this, this applies. I think Marshall McLuhan talks about every prosthetic that we add is also involves an amputation, right? So, I mean, he, McLuhan always talks in these sort of pithy one-liners. Um, but I think he's getting at this idea that every time we try to enhance one thing, we're going to inevitably lose something else. And yeah, sort of generally speaking, is living longer and being healthy a good thing to pursue? Obviously. But I think that pursuing a long life, for instance, single-handedly, I think it just changes the landscape of norms in such a way that on closer reflection, I'm not sure if it's always going to be worth the trade-off. Um, at least I want to say that it's an open question. Uh, Vladimir. Thank you so much. Well, and thank you so much, Professor Vuko. This was really extremely interesting. And uh, it prompts me to try to tease out a couple of comments from you in regard to political economy of enhancement, meaning the following. Uh, you hardly mentioned what's the third and right, uh, mighty argument against it, or at least sort of regulating it. How democratizing those experiments would be in the future? With all these huge, like take take the chat GPT, pretty much everybody can use it, right? But we know from other examples, such as medical treatments, how undemocratizing and different can it be for different folks? It doesn't matter so much because the best care in the world will probably give you 20 years longer life than me. Still potato, potato in one way. Fast forward a couple of decades of enhancements and the fears of basically having two races being along one another are not so far away. Uh, we saw during the COVID crisis that democratization of access to health still matters. Probably the way the vaccines had been distributed. Um, imagine if the vaccines were given only to those who could have afforded them. I fear there would be something next to civil war. And then I imagine, even though some of the enhancements turned out to be very cheap uh, and very accessible, that those who you're talking about would be for selected few. And what would be the ramifications of that political economy of enhancement? Great. Thanks for the question, Vladimir. And I, I think it's a huge issue and I, I didn't treat it much, but it's something that was very much in the background. Um, I tried to hint at it a little bit with the one slide with the Silicon Valley companies, um, because I think that the point you're making is really important one. So I think that there's a few different dimensions where you can talk about the undemocrat and undemocrat. I'm going to slur my words here. Um, the tendency of enhancing technologies to push against democratic ideals. Um, First of all, is sort of the, the question of access that you've, ra that you've raised already, which is who gets access to the technologies um, is clearly going to be people with power and influence and money um, and not more vulnerable populations. And like you said, you know, the immediate applications, potato, potato, you know, a little nudge to the IQ, a couple extra years probably doesn't really matter. But if you iterate on that, clearly you're going to have really important and undemocratic implications from that. I think there's another dimension to think about here, which is 
the way in which a lot of these technologies are going is explicitly in a capitalistic and large corporation direction. So who is it that's sort of taking the lead on brain computer interfaces right now? I mean, it's Elon Musk is sort of the one that's churning a lot. It's not the only person doing the research and there's a whole bunch of, he's, he's the one who's marketed it the best so far. Um, but who has the capacity to bring that to large scale market? It's going to be somebody with a lot of capital behind them. Um, all the life extension technologies, not all of them, but a lot of the research into life extension, as I mentioned, is being funded by giant Silicon Valley tech corporations. Um, so I think there's also this um, worry about, and this is something I didn't really address at all, and maybe it's not quite what you were asking about, Vladimir, but I also have a big worry about not only who benefits from the technologies, but how are the technologies being put to use and who's making money off of them? Um, because already we're seeing trends that the people that are going to be making the money and having the influence and gathering the data from them are going to be the regular suspects. And that's also a um, influence against democracy that I think is, is related to, but slightly different than just the pure access issue, which is a huge issue in its own right. And there's this also, there's this also issue of um, who are the ones that are actually controlling this and to what effect. And my worry is that, um, the, the sorts of goods that Jay was bringing up, which I think are really important questions to think about, um, are quickly and rapidly being co-opted by capitalist goods that, um, and the other ones are being subsumed under them. Awesome. Uh, uh, Chris. Yeah, thanks a lot for the talk. I, I wanted to, um, I guess it's more a technical question than was asked, the less broad question. I, I'm, I'm interested in this, um, the first uh, horn of your dilemma, the object uh, objectivity horn. Um, and I guess I'm not exactly convinced and maybe I don't understand how the argument's supposed to go. Um, so it's just a prelude. I would just like double down on Jay's point about the capabilities approach. It's, you know, it's pretty much now in human development circles, which thanks to Amartya Sen and others over the last 45 years has pretty much taken over uh, objective metrics of how, how well people's lives are going. Um, it's a really useful uh, approach, and it's quite developed and quite iterated, and there's a lot of research there. So it's not just a few theorists developing stuff. Um, there are actually, you know, capabilities that we can more or less measure. Some are harder, like the capability for um, freedom is pretty difficult to measure, but the capability for health is pretty easy to measure, right, and, and so on. So that's just a really prelude. So I didn't understand, back to the argument, I didn't understand why we were comparing between these three cases. I take it that if you're asking about enhancement, you're asking at, about Mercedes with the enhancement and Mercedes without the enhancement. You're asking about, I'm sorry, I forgot my names of the people, the, the person who wants to go fishing with their son, right? With a leg and without a leg, with a boat and without a boat, yeah? Uh, with a life that's 10 years longer, without a life that's 10 years longer, right? You're not comparing Mercedes to Rodrigo. You're comparing Rodrigo with and without the enhancement. That's the that's the thing. And then the question is, is it objectively useful for them to have that? And then we go. Okay, so that's one part. Why is it an inter interpersonal comparison rather than an intrapersonal comparison, since we're talking about enhancing individual persons? And then the second part was I didn't really understand the the force of, well, it's ableist. And maybe here I need more story about what's exactly wrong with ableism. One way of understanding what's wrong with ableism is it's on the model of it's wrong with racism. Racism picks out an arbitrary characteristic that has no moral or impactful uh, uh, thing on people that's not an, an appropriate way of, of judging them, right? There's there's no sort of hierarchy of races in the world. And so it's arbitrary to, to be racist, right? So something like that. But that doesn't really work with ableism because ableism is picking out characteristics like has a heart condition, doesn't have a heart condition, right? Is able to read, isn't able to read. And those don't look like racial or sexual characteristics that are the sort of purely arbitrary um, from a moral point of view characteristics. So then you have to get some more story about what's wrong with ableism that's quite different. It can't be on the model of racism and sexism. It has to be on some other model, some other model. I don't know what that would be, but 
then once you start filling that in, it looks like there's a lot more sort of normatively packed in that has to then be unpacked in order to do your objective, uh, your argument against the objective criteria. So if it's, for instance, forcing people to live up to a single normative standard of what a decent life is, right, that sort of normalization story, um, then, of course, it's kind of strange to say, well, objective criteria are necessarily ableist. Not necessarily. They're making comparative inferences about the intrapersonal differences that one would have with this and, and without that. And then the sort of worry about arbitrary discrimination really goes outside the window, and you have to do a lot more normative work on the ableist side. So I'm, I'm just kind of confused about how the argument works, if you could maybe help me out. Yeah, thanks a lot for the questions, Christopher. Um, so first of all, on the, I think it's a good point. I think that the, the um, examples would be better if they were intrapersonal rather than intrapersonal. Um, here's what I want to say, and I this, this might, I don't know, I, I'd be happy to have more conversation about this. I think I really do want to say that even when it's intrapersonal, it's not clear to me that the extra 10 years or the 10 points of IQ or the little bit more efficient is a good without some sort of framework of a larger telos or larger perspective of what a good human life is undergirding that. Um, so is it better for me to live to be 100 or 110? Is it better for me to have just a little bit more IQ? I really want to push on that and say, why would me being a little smarter be the better or more desirable version of me? Um, it might be, depending on the goods that I'm pursuing and depending on how I understand what it means to live a worthwhile human life and the communities I live in. And all there's, there's this whole network of things that that could affect. And I just, I'm, I'm not convinced that even on the intrapersonal level, it's just obviously clear that an uptick in all of those in, again, the, the cases don't really matter, but you know, Mercedes and Xavier, I had these little vignettes for you. Um, even if it would have been intrapersonal, I still would have wanted to say, I think that, no, you need more context for what goods are being aimed at. And if this particular good fits into that larger normative story, um, so I think that I think that's what I would say about your initial question about the intrapersonal comparison is that I, I just I don't think that it's clear. I think that um, it, it depends in what way the extra ten years or the extra maybe the extra if I have a significantly higher IQ um, that damages the way I relate to others um, in some ways, right? Maybe. Maybe if I live longer, that um, that undermines communities in a way that I, I don't actually want to pursue. So I, I think no, that you need- easy. That's, e that's easy. Sorry to interrupt. Easy. You would see more of your friends dying, for instance. Yeah, exactly. You could see more of your- So no, I, I just think that it's it's not obvious. Thanks, Vladimir. Um, that's exactly what I'm trying to get at here is, is not that these aren't good things to pursue. I, th I think most of them probably do come out as good, but I think you need a larger moral normative story before you're able to say, this is why this is a good that's worthwhile of my pursuit. So it, um, can I just yeah, yeah, jump course, in? Does of course. It, it sounds like then the argument is that since it's not universally good, it can't be intrinsically good. That is to say, it's since it's not universally good in every single situation, it can't be intrinsically good. But of course, that's false. Any intrinsic good, given a sufficient you know, fancy story about aliens coming from Mars eating green ice cream, um, is going to be bad in some particular context. The intrinsic good is not the same as universally good, right? So the, the notion of context specificity doesn't get you, it's not an intrinsic good. I don't understand. And that's the point of these more fancy accounts of objective well-being, is they're supposed to pick out things that are generally intrinsically good, number one, and generally universally good, but maybe not in every single case, right? I mean, you can think of a case where the, the capability to read actually hurts somebody. But okay, but the capability to read is intrinsically good. Yeah, no, I'm I'm actually I, I think I'm okay saying that there is certain intrinsic good that that certain goods conferred by enhancement are intrinsically good. I think that what I want to say is that it might be in competition with other intrinsic goods and might be might be at odds with the larger normative context in which you're pursuing those intrinsic goods. Um, 
So yeah, I mean, I, again, I, I really actually, this this talk made me seem like I'm an anti-enhancement person. I, I'm actually not. I just think that, and, and maybe maybe in a way, a certain kind of qualified transhumanism, I'm totally fine with. I just think that um, there needs to be more thought about what intrinsic goods are actually being pursued um, and how those relate to each other and how they fit into a larger normative context. And I just, my, my sense is that our initial sort of transhumanist impulses, and here's where I too, I wanna make this point, not just about scholarly transhumanists, um, because I think that they're, they've seen this point for the most part. I also want to make the larger point about transhumanist motivation generally, which is that I think sometimes the initial motivation is not as well grounded when we actually think through the larger normative context in which those motivations are occurring in. Um, does that does that at least start to... Yes, yeah, so I, I want to concede the point about intrinsic goods. I'm totally fine with that. Um, I just think that yeah, in the larger context, I'm not convinced that it's always going to be obvious that the that that the the thing that we recognize as intrinsic good is in that context worthy of pursuit. Um, maybe just really quick on the the ableist concern, um, and I see some other hands up too, so I want to make sure to get to other folks. I think my worry here, and this is not an argument, but what's going on in the background is I get. I get very nervous about any sort of normative distribution in which the people who wind up on the bottom or as living less valuable lives are the most vulnerable people. Um, I think it's just always an occasion for us to stop and think about what's going on here such that we've carved up our normative territory or our conception of the good life such that predictable populations that are vulnerable in one way or another are not cutting it in some way. So I think that's the, again, that's not an argument for you, um, Chris, but it's sort of, I think that's the worry in the background is running this. It just, it looks to me like that's a territory we can slip into very, very quickly. So it's, it's not, I'm not claiming that running lines that things like health are an intrinsic good or ability, right? It's like, well, yeah, of course they are, but like you're, when you're when you're running that argument, I just want to sort of caution, put the cautionary thing that make sure you're not carving up normative territory in this way. And I think you're one or two premises away from doing that. Great, uh, Nir and then Rajan. Uh, Joe, thank you. Super interesting uh, talk. Uh, I wanted to uh, uh, raise a question about the second uh, argument, the argument from novelty and uh, to suggest the potential uh, third argument and see what you think about it. So uh, as I understood you, the argument from uh, novelty uh, was um, that uh, there was a degree of burnout that was uh, going to be involved in it, that there was going to be a degree of sort of uh, jadedness that would uh, um, uh, set in. Um, my sense is that I'm not sure that's the uh, um, most prominent problem with the pursuit of novelty uh, for its own sake, because you could uh, think about background conditions in which the burnout uh, uh, wouldn't set in. So, uh, you know, Kierkegaard was uh, pretty depressive, and I think uh, as a result, uh, easily prone to burnout. Uh, somebody else with a different uh, uh, psychological uh, makeup uh, wouldn't necessarily uh, burn out. Or another thing that uh, sort of inclines us to, uh, you know, either burnout or jadedness or uh, despair or I can't be bothered is the background conditions of our own life. So, you know, if there's a lot going on for us and we can't make ends meet and, uh, you know, there are relationship problems, et cetera, et cetera, then our bandwidth for considering new things is smaller and then we become despaired more easily than somebody for whom things are going well and uh, they have more bandwidth for uh, novelty. Uh, so, uh, for my money, the uh, problem for uh, pursuing novelty uh, uh, for its own sake is that then you uh, often uh, draw conclusions from the fact that the new has to be adopted. So, for example, in the university context, uh, we've been seeing this here, uh, uh, I've been seeing this in other universities, just the fact that ChatGPT uh, as a writing tool has come on the horizon means we immediately must reevaluate how we teach critical thinking, 
uh, what we do with our writing, throw away our assignments, let's retrain faculty to teach people how to prompt GPT rather than to keep writing. I mean, right? Just because it's new, it must be adopted. Uh, but that's different from, so that's an argument for sort of curiosity for its own sake. I'm sorry, that's an argument against curiosity from, for its own sake, but it's an argument not from uh, despair, but an argument from what you're talking a little bit about earlier, that just because something is new doesn't mean that it's good. So that's my question about the second argument. And then I wanted to propose a third argument that you didn't raise for your consideration against certain forms uh, of enhancement, and it's a virtue ethics argument, namely that um, uh, certain preoccupations uh, uh, with enhancement, they uh, induce a habit of mind of self-preoccupation, uh, of uh, making ourselves our own project, uh, almost a kind of technologically induced uh, narcissism. So for example, all of these uh, uh, health trackers, which I myself uh, uh, enjoy, uh, they induce the uh, sense that you, uh, you know, absolutely have to uh, pay very close attention to, uh, you know, hack yourself into maximal efficiency, make sure your heart rate is at the right level when you run, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You start to, that you got enough oxygen in your sleep, and you start taking yourself a little too seriously in some, in some way. Um, so um, the argument for, from humility, if you will. All right. Thanks a lot for those questions. Um, so I'll, I'll tackle the tackle them in the order you asked them. Um, so first is this idea about, um, let me just gather my thoughts here. Okay. Yeah. So the, the first is this idea about the, the Kierkegaard line about despair. Um, and I really do want to lean into despair as a more technical term and not merely as burnout. So I take it burnout is something that needs to be experienced subjectively, right? Is that I, I feel burned out or I've, I've been chasing one new thing after the other and I just, I'm, I'm sick of it, I'm sick of the world. Um, I take it that Kierkegaard has something slightly different in mind and I wanna have something slightly different in mind too, which is despair is an objective state of being, whether it's experienced being so or not, which is defined precisely by the, the chasing one new thing after the other without any sort of commitment. So in either or, which is a great book, it's, it's, I just was going back to it. It's deeply funny. I really enjoy that book, but his, his contrast in that is the, the athlete, um, the person who's just chasing one new thing after the other is, um, is contrasted with the judge, right? And the judge is giving this argument that the way you find meaning is through something like commitment. So it keeps on coming back to things like marriage or sort of committing to an ideal. Um, and the argument isn't that you're eventually going to burn out um, if you just chase one new thing after the other, um, even though that might happen, but it's rather that the very state of being of someone who hasn't committed to anything, but is just chasing, chasing new things because now they can, maybe they're their, um, the expanse of good things that they can go after has grown because of enhancement. Um, that just is what despair is. Um, so I think that the argument about background conditions, sort of setting someone up for either burnout or maybe they're more resilient, I think that absolutely applies to burnout, but I don't think it does apply to despair. I think that you very well might be resilient and you might reach the end of your life as, you know, the enhanced human being and say, that was just awesome, right? I got to explore all of these great things one after another. And every 10 years, I got a little new boost and a whole new room of realm of goods opened up to me. Um, that might be their subjective experience and it might be their background conditions that led them to experience it like that. But I would still argue that they were still experiencing a state of despair because there hasn't been commitment to anything. And there hasn't, it, it has just been this one good thing after the other. Um, so that would be the response to the first thing that you were you were um, talking about is sort of how how background conditions might might play into that that second horn of dilemma I was running. I would say yes, background conditions play into burnout, but not necessarily despair because despair is an objective condition. Um, the second problem that you were running was about yeah, sort of the the way in which new enhancement or new technology, something like a Fitbit could actually undermine virtuous action. Um, I'm on the fence about this. I, I've got a forthcoming article on the relationship between moral enhancement and virtue formation. 
And I actually think that the, the TLDR here is that I think that enhancements can either play into or detract from virtue formation. And it depends on motivational structures that can't, or at least it would be very hard to see how they could directly be enhanced or targeted through enhancing technologies. So I actually think that, yeah, in, in the, in the sort of, um, the scenario you gave where I'm relentlessly checking my Fitbit and trying to maximize my sleep and trying to always hit my target heart rate for exactly 23 minutes during my workout. Cause that's what my doctor told me I needed to do. Um, I take it that's just going to not lead to virtue because you're, you're using it in an unproductive way, but I take it that there's ways in which, um, you know, I don't know. Um, there's, there's strategies for nudging up empathy levels. And let's say that I, I really want to become a more empathetic person. And I have a whole motivational structure in which that's a virtue that I'm pursuing. I think that's absolutely something that enhancement can help with. It's just that what I really want to say is that it's not the technologies that selves or that are either going to lead to vice or virtue, but it's always the intervention paired with a larger motivational structure for which if there is a way to enhance that larger motivational structure, it's very unclear how we would do that exactly right now. Great. Uh, Ranjan. Uh, yes. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Joe, for the really uh, interesting talk and, and for setting the stage for such an interesting discussion. Uh, I'll leave with saying I'm not, I'm not a philosopher by any means, and so I apologize if I'm missing the point on some front. But uh, I really appreciate your emphasis on context uh, as being an important thing to bring in and, and define and discuss before one can actually talk about value judgments and so on. The, uh, the thing that I, that, you know, my problem is my question keeps changing as, as people keep commenting because it just gets richer, the discussion gets richer. But in the, in the, on the subject of context, it, it occurs to me that there might be uh, many contexts, simultaneous contexts to consider even within any given context, there's nested context. So any given individual from their own point of view, you know, uh, uh, trying to cast judgment or uh, discernment upon their own situation might have competing internal contexts to reconcile uh, at the same time. And those have to be weighed at the same time. Society could weigh in at different scales, scale of the family, scale of the, of the, of the group, the tribe, scale of the, you know, the nation state and so on, uh, you know, and, and competing values and cultural context there. Um, and at times it can be valuable to go against those, right? So there's, there's, there's layers upon layers of context to consider. Um, and I, I wonder if anyone has, if, if you've, you know, considered this and, and tried to um, formalize it in some way or are thinking about that. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, and I totally agree with you. Um, as far as if I formalized it yet or not, not, nothing that I've been working on recently, have I sort of put together a formal description of um, the way different contexts might intersect to, to sort of lead to this idea of um, whether something is worth pursuing or not. Um, yeah, but I, I think I, I would just elevate exactly what you just said, which is that I think that that's exactly the direction I want to push in ultimately is a context in which we're not so much starting with the technology itself, um, but rather starting with a rich understanding of our social individual. Um, and, and like you just were saying, Ranjan, like all these different nested contexts. And that's where we start with figuring out what goods we're pursuing in those contexts, if they are in fact goods. Um, coming back to Chris's observation, right? Even after recognizing that it's an intrinsic good, how does it fit into that larger normative and social scheme in which we're pursuing it? And then once we've done that analysis and thoughtful reflection, I'm all for getting a neural link. And you know, what, if, that, if that lines up and that's going to contribute to the good, um, sign me up. So I, I'm actually, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm sympathetic to a lot of transhumanist projects um, and a lot of transhumanist scholarship. I think at the end of the day, I, I just want to push for something that's more context relative and more thoughtful about the ways in which values may be context relative and relative to larger normative structures in which we're making those decisions. So 
Jay, do you mind if I ask? A, is that okay? Or you, no, you, you, you go up? ahead. I, I, I have just a brief comment after you're done. Okay. J uh, Joe, do you have time for one more? One I've or got two time different? for one more. Yeah. Okay. So um, really interesting talk. And I want to, I want to give you the opportunity to become a transhumanist here today. Um, <laughs> ju just the opportunity. Come on down to the altar. <laughs> I was going to say, I know I, I'd be in good company if that's the direction I went. So. <laughs> Yeah. Well, so the only reason I say that is because I, I want to give you an opportunity to see if you could sketch out, you have these two options. Um, is it possible for you to sketch out an option three that you would be comfortable with that transhumanists represent? And the reason that I, I say that, and I just want to say something briefly. Um, so Nir mentioned the idea of burnout. So there's a great book, Byung Chul Han. I don't know if you've read his book, Burnout, but he talks about the sort of like excesses of positivity as being consistent with burnout. So this idea of sort of ever chasing um, more and more. And I do wonder if some of the problems that you have with the way that um, transhumanists, as you're describing, approach things is, is kind of a problem with efficiency and excessive positivity. And I wonder if there's almost like, you know, an Aristotelian Marxist framework where you could be, you know, you could have this kind of more comfortable transhumanist approach that recognizes that new needs will be continuously developed and perhaps, you know, an enhanced life is a flourishing life or something like that. Maybe that would be more accommodating um, to you. So I don't know. Is there a is there a position three where you could say, OK, if this was option three, then I'd be comfortable being a transhumanist? Yeah, yeah, no. So absolutely. So I, I could have given a different talk today where I did the the Luddite takedown, right? So um, I actually don't think the the anti-enhancement, anti-technology argument has much legs to stand on either. Um, so I'm very much a, a middle way sort of person. And um, maybe at the end of the day, my position you could describe as transhumanist. If so, you know, I, I'm not afraid of the label. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say that I, I think actually I, I like your approach too, Alec. I think sort of the the Marxist Aristotelian, because I think what that does is hit on both some of the social concerns I have, where I think we're getting sometimes suckered in by transhumanist projects with really just capitalist structures that are trying to make us more efficient workers, um, which I think there's all sorts of problems with that I think the Marxist framework can help us think through. And then the Aristotelian route of thinking through, and again, this is what I've been trying to sort of harp on a little bit today is thinking about what does an actually flourishing human life look like? Um, and are, again, intrinsic goods like health. I, I'm happy to say that's an intrinsic good, but in what ways does being healthy contribute to a flourishing life? And when does it butt up against limitations to contributing to that flourishing life? Um, I think between those two frameworks, once we've done that analysis, I am totally happy to say that, yeah, then, you know, bring the enhancement on just after we've done that investigation of our values. Um, so like I said, I, I could have, I, I maybe, maybe I was, I knew my audience and wanted to do the one that would rile up more people on this one, but I, I could have absolutely given you the, the sort of pro technology argument too. Um, because I, I think that a lot of the, the Luddite or even maybe they're not all Luddites, but sort of the Luddite adjacent arguments that get run sometime. I don't think many of those have legs to stand on either. Yeah. I and mean, I really, so I really like, the idea, and I'm interested in that forthcoming paper of how can we think about technological enhancement in relation to the development of virtues? I mean, in many ways, it gets to kind of de-skilling questions, right? I mean, are, if we're actively de-skilling people at work, we are preventing them from developing certain capabilities. I mean, Bronesis, uh, Nir has written a great paper on exactly this and sort of this de-skilling effects of automation. And I wonder, so then like, you know, it seems like a virtue ethics approach could be really really useful there. Which yeah. And I, and I think, I know you all are doing a lot of the, the ethics of work right now. And I mean, I think that's a really important perspective to have here is like, you know, is the, is the technology simply in the name of efficiency, simply in the name of corporate interests, or is it something that is genuinely contributing to our well being as, as workers, as people in the world and as social beings? Yeah. Yeah. Very few people have experienced the Zen of plowing a field now that we have tractors and I just think everyone should think about that. <laughs> but no, I was riffing on the same thing. I just wanted my final comment was that um, I have been trying for a long time to write about moral enhancement and the virtues approach. I'm also a Buddhist, so the virtues approach eventually came naturally. 
And um, I think one of the things I find most challenging about that whole domain is the challenges for a liberal democratic or social democratic or Marxist Aristotelian approach to human values in a context where we can modify our own motivations and even the boundaries of our own personality. I mean, the idea of the challenges to human agency, once we start sharing thoughts, uh, allowing other people to have some experience of tweaking our brain or whatever, all those kinds of things I think are really problematic in this future. And I'm glad that you've seen the kind of vacuity of a lot of the anti-enhancement arguments. But um, for me, the, the, the neuro stuff is the one that's really challenging. And I'll just suggest, and maybe you've already thought about this, that the suppression of vice and the enhancement of virtue is very comparable to the debate over therapy versus enhancement. Yeah, I agree. I no, I agree that there's a lot of overlap between the yeah sort of um, trying to eliminate vice versus enhancing for virtue. I think there is overlap. I also agree with you, Jay, that when you're talking about neuro stuff and moral stuff, there's a couple of additional layers of complication. In that, I think it's, I think when you're talking about elimination of vice, just because you're in the solidly normative domain already, I think it does become more complicated than merely talking about you know, I've got a bum knee and need to go see an, an orthopedist. Um, that's clearly a treatment. Whereas I've got this vice I can't kick. I need to go see my local neuroscientist that's going to help me out with, right? I mean, I think I think it's it's it tracks, but it's not a perfect one-to-one. -one. And I think there are additional complications. And then I agree with you too. I think the, the neuro enhancement um, and neuro interventions generally are at least more complicated in that there's this extra layer of, enhancing the way the way we think and the way our motivational structure is. And um, yeah, not that there's not a way forward there, but I, I think that it, it adds this extra layer um, that when we're talking about merely something like life extension isn't there, when you apply it to the brain, all of a sudden everything gets a little bit more complicated. Nir, did you have something to say? No, no, I'm just thinking. Oh, okay, all right. Okay, well, I think that's a good place to leave it. We've We've been here an hour and a half and we know you have other things going on in your life. So we appreciate you being here with us though. Yeah, no, of course, of course. Thanks for having me and thanks for the really rich discussion. This was a lot of fun and I hope we all get to meet in person sometime rather than just over Zoom. Seriously. Absolutely. That would be yeah, that's absolutely. great. Thanks a lot. Thank that you. I'll look great. you up in Chicago. Yeah, no, if you're ever in Chicago, everyone's, uh, it's an open invitation. Loyola's right in the city, so it's easy to meet up. Great. Cool. Thank Thanks, you. Joe. Much Everybody. appreciated.